And good morning. Good to see everybody here. Uh, this is good to see. Was your name Heskett? Yes, sir. What was your name again? Brian Heskett. Good to see you and your family here today. Good to see you back. Good to see Mark and Karen back with us. Mark said that he didn't think anybody would recognize him with his mask on. <laughs> Uh, Kathy reminds us that there are still eggs in the refrigerator, so um, those are back there for you to take. Uh, also, <clears throat> the walk for life will be uh, this coming week, so if you've not, if you want to go ahead and write your checks, make your contributions, uh, those would be welcomed. And there's still sign-up sheets up here, and I think. Uh, Chloe said she didn't have hers here, but if you want to uh, donate through Chloe, then uh, see uh, Chloe. Um, okay, Sherry uh, and has she has tested positive for COVID, and she's doing well, um, and no one has been in contact with them after she was uh, exposed to it so there doesn't appear to be any any danger there but just keep that in mind any other announcements this morning Better late than never. Yeah. <laughs> I also bid you a good morning. So, uh, Kirby, since you're here, we, we're having choir practice after church, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll wait a little, a week or two, and let you get settled. Here's our call to worship from Habakkuk, a, a familiar passage you'll recognize. <clears throat> though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hind's feet. He makes me to walk on my high places. We could put that in more contemporary terms, maybe more significant to us. Although fires burn the west coast, Although straight line winds destroy the crops in the Midwest, although hurricanes wash away the South, even though riots should destroy our cities and a mysterious virus should threaten all of us, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Will you? Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning.
we stand for the doxology followed by our invocation. Colder, would you open in prayer for us, please, sir? Yes, Father, we, though all these things are going on around us, yes, Lord, we will exult in your name. Mm -hmm. We worship you and praise you, Lord. We are uh, humbled at all that you've done for us, humbled that you would redeem us out of our, out of our sin and love us when we we're so unworthy. We thank you, Lord. We ask now for your blessing upon this service. We desire that your name would be magnified and glorified in our midst today. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Please remain standing and take your blue hymnal and turn to number 59. I sing the mighty power of God, and then we'll do number 43. Great is thy faithfulness. First of all, 59.
seated. What great songs, what great messages. Uh, keep your hymn book and turn to page 459. 459. We have a responsive reading there on, on that page. Let's read God's word responsively. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Let's go to our Good Shepherd in prayer. <clears throat> we praise you and thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the Good Shepherd. And we thank you that you, the Good Shepherd, laid down your life for the sheep. Thank you for loving us so much that you would do that for us. You gave yourself as the sacrifice for our sin, the payment that we could not pay. Your great love is beyond our understanding. Indeed, great is your faithfulness. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Blessings all ours and 10,000 besides. We praise you and worship you. We ask that our worship today may be pleasing in your sight and that you would be exalted in the midst of your people and those who join us online. Oh Lord, be exalted. May our worship be pleasing in your sight. We come to you as our shepherd expressing our need as you have invited us to do so. You know the things on our hearts. You know the situations that we fa uh, face in our lives. You know what's going on. But you've invited us to bring our requests before you, to make our needs known. For you are a God who cares for us. And so, Father, with all that is going on around us, I'd like this morning specifically to pray for our firefighters, especially those who are out west battling the, the forest fires in great danger. And Lord, we pray for their safety. We pray that you would give them strength to do their, their very dangerous job. And we pray that, that you would give them effectiveness as they control this fire, as they protect lives and property. The Lord be with them. I pray for your protection upon police officers all around our country, especially in the, in the cities. Lord, I pray that you would keep them from harm's way. Keep them from those who would, who would hurt them, harm them. We pray that you would help them to do their job in a, 
responsible and compassionate way, in an effective way. Oh Lord, we pray for peace in our country. We pray for military men and women around the world. We pray that you would encourage them and protect them from harm. This morning we think specifically of Shelby in Hawaii and pray that you would give peace to her heart and that you would guide her and her new husband and keep them in your care. Lord, we pray for all these folks in positions of authority, again, for your protection and for your guidance and help in the work that they've been called to do. At the same time, we pray, Lord, for those in authority over us, our elected officials. We pray for wisdom and guidance in these difficult days. We pray that you'd give them a heart to do what is right and just and true and good. And Lord, I pray for your sheep here in this particular fold for peace, for a sense of calm, Keep us from panic, keep us from despair, keep us hoping in you, exulting in you, because you are the God of our salvation. So again, be glorified in our midst. Through Jesus, our Lord and our Good Shepherd, we pray. Amen. Let's sing some more. Jack, uh, 45, I think, is our next number. I'm going to do uh, 45 and 47. I might mention on uh, number uh, 45, surely goodness and mercy, that uh, we'll be doing the final refrain just after the third verse only. So 45 is surely goodness and mercy. 47, God will take care of you. And just one uh, additional personal note here. Uh, again, I echo welcoming the Kirby's uh, back with us. And a true story, I mentioned this before several years ago, but when Karen always was over there about where Elaine is now, I uh, actually I always picked up on her voice because I knew if I was on the same note she was on, I was singing it correctly. And Karen, with uh, a great set of hearing aids I have now, I'm actually picking up just enough of your singing back there. It's really helping me again, just like old times. So thanks so much for helping me out. Number 45, shall we stand please?
47. Last week we began a study of the book of Philippians, so I invite you to take your Bible and turn to, not Philippians, Acts 16. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 16. Yes, even though we are starting Philippians, we want to start in Acts chapter 16, actually. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. 
for revealing yourself to us in your word, for revealing to us the way of salvation. Thank you for revealing your great love for us. I pray that as we begin this wonderful little book of Philippians, that you would give us a greater understanding of who you are, what you've done for us, and how we should respond. This morning, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So last week when we began, we, we began by looking at Philippians as a great drama that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are authoring and directing. And we began to meet some of the characters in this drama, Paul and Timothy and the saints there in Philippi, as well as the elders and deacons there. Continuing in that theme, we want to go to Acts chapter 16 and get to know some of the main characters in this great drama that God is producing. And so we'll jump right into it and begin to get to know Lydia in verse 11 of chapter 16 of Acts. Are you there? So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lydia is a good example of a first century liberated woman. She's a professional woman. And we get the hint from the fact that she is a seller of purple that she's a high society woman, a woman of some means. Because purple dye in those days was more precious than gold. It's extracted drop by drop from a specific snail and very rare and very costly. So if she's a dealer in this dye, in this fabric, she must be pretty well off. We certainly don't get the picture of her being a meek and mousy doormat for her husband. In fact, we don't even see a husband in the picture. We don't know if he is dead, if she's a widower, a widow, or maybe if he spends all his day at the city gate arguing philosophy with the elders. We don't know where the husband is, but there is Lydia, a well-off business professional woman. What matters is not her standing in society or her wealth, but the fact that she is sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. And here we see the Lord working in her heart to make her responsive to the message that Paul and his friends bring. Besides that, she's hospitable, and she has them to come and stay in her house. We'll get to see a little bit more about Lydia next week. Let's go on to the next character in this drama, continuing at verse 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. But when the masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. 
And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. Pause there. This unnamed slave girl is just the opposite of Lydia. Where Lydia is high society, wealthy, this poor slave girl, we don't even know her name, is at the bottom end of the social ladder. Probably a teenager, but used for profit, only for what her pimps can get out of her. And then when they realize that they can't get anything more out of her, they cast her off. They're no, she's no good to them anymore. She's just a tool, just a means for others to get wealthy. Doesn't she remind you of the gathering demoniacs that Jesus drove the demons out from and into the swine of, or into the herd of swine and the herd of swine jumped into the sea? Remember that? Remember how the people of the area responded? Oh, they were so glad that two men were rescued and saved from demonic oppression, weren't they? No. They were not concerned about people they were more concerned about their profit line. And there goes their wealth into the sea. And they drove Jesus out of their midst. This poor slave girl reminds me of feminists today who claim or complain about women not being treated fairly, being objectified, and yet they continue to give their bodies to pornography, to movies, to modeling, that simply exist to excite the lusts of men. They continue to allow themselves to be used as tools for the profit of other people. I don't understand that. Why don't they object to that? Why do they allow themselves to continue being used as property, as tools? This girl doesn't have a choice. She's not only captive to her pimps, but she's also captive to this demon. And Paul, through the Lord Jesus Christ, sets her free from that. And her captives are not happy. And they want to drag Paul and his companions before the authorities for ruining their profit. Let's continue. Let's look at the next character. We're going to jump down to verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. So here's the Philippian jailer. Lydia, high class, wealthy woman, the, the teenage slave girl on the bottom of the social rung, poor and captivated. Right in the middle is the jailer, probably in the middle class, as society would have it in those days. Middle class, but he's just as much a captive as his captors are. He is stuck in a dead-end job with no hope of, av of advancement. And when I say dead end, I mean that literally because if his prisoners escape, he pays with his life. 
And so when we jump down to verse 30, <coughs> and he recognizes that his prisoners have escaped, he says, oh, what must I do to be saved? It could be, it could be that he is saying, what can I do to become a Christian and a good Presbyterian? Could be that he's saying that. It could be simply that he's saying, what can I do to save my neck? I'm in trouble now. He's either going to incur the judgment of Rome or he's going to incur the judgment of God. Either way, it's not looking very good for him. So he asks, what must I do to be saved? Whatever he's intending by the question, Paul takes the opportunity to share the gospel with him. And it's really, really very, very complicated in verse 31, do you see it? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's pretty rough, isn't it? Huh? How can... <laughs> Is that it? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, in verse 32, they continue to speak the word of the Lord to him and help him to understand what that means. But it's no more complicated than believing in Jesus, trusting him for your salvation. He's the one that paid for your sin that you couldn't pay for. That you couldn't pay for. He's the one who gave his life for you. Just trust him. Just believe in him. But what happened to that Philippian jailer? Did he pay for their escape with his life? No. It looks like Paul and the other prisoners went back to their cells. Because there's where the officials found them the next morning. They had regard for this Philippian jailer. We don't know his name either. But they respected him enough to go back to their cells. And let the Lord work the situation out however he wanted to. For the sake of his life. Maybe we'll get to know him a little bit better too next week. So here's the main cast of characters in this drama that God is authoring. Lydia, teenage slave girl, demonic, demon possessed, and the jailer. Those are our main characters, and we have a couple more characters in supporting roles. For example, we have Silas, mentioned there in chapter 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Silas, what do we know about Silas? His name. <laughs> and that's about it. Silas is a big question mark. We don't really know anything about him. It's kind of interesting that it's never Silas and Paul. It's always Paul and Silas. Silas is content to take a supporting role on the back part of the stage. Not out in front with the main characters, but in the background where we don't know anything about him except his name. And the fact that he has given himself along with Paul to the service of the Lord. To do whatever the Lord is calling him to do. Whether it be sit in a jail cell and sing hymns of praise. Or whether it be to evangelize by the riverside. There he is willing to be used by the Lord. Content to play his role. Not for recognition. Not for the applause of the audience simply because this is what God has called him to do and he's glad to do it, to magnify the Lord. And then we have another character in a supporting role and that is Luke himself, the reporter, the recorder, if you will, the guy who's writing this account. And he's not named in this passage but he's recording all these events that take place. He's reporting on what he sees. 
want you to notice something interesting about Luke. Go back to chapter 16, verse... Where am I? Yeah, verse uh, 9. Let me start at verse 6. Look at 16.6. Look at the pronoun there. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. They... Up to now in the book of Acts, everything is in the third person. They did this, they did that, they did this, they did that. When we come to chapter 16, verse 9, look how the pronoun changes. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From now on, everything is in the first person. We did this, us. It is as if Luke joined this traveling missionary group in Troas from then on. And he becomes part of the story. But again, in the background, just recording what is taking place. We know from other passages that Luke, by profession, is a physician or a doctor. There's some speculation, and it is just speculation, so take this with a, with a grain of salt. But, but the speculation is that he joined the team as a physician to minister to whatever Paul's thorn in the flesh was. What was that physical ailment that Paul had? Was it a vision problem or some other physical issue that Paul was dealing with? So Luke joins to be his personal physician along the way. Just conjecture. There's no real evidence to that. But what we do know is that like Silas, Luke is content to be in the background, to let others have the spotlight just to serve the Lord through serving his people. Recording the events guided by the Holy Spirit so that we can grow thereby. Lydia, a slave girl, a jailer, Silas, Luke, along with Timothy, whom we met last week, The good shepherd has all kinds of sheep in his sheepfold. And this chapter of these verses that we have read give us a good cross section of God's church. In God's church, there are all kinds of sheep. There are rich people, there are poor people. There are high society people, there are people on the low ends of the social run. There are educated people. There are simple people. Rich and poor, sophisticated, simple. Men, women, children, young, old, Jew, Gentile, you name it. A good sampling of everybody. All kinds of sheep in his sheepfold. Here's a good picture of it here in Acts, or Acts chapter 16. It would be very easy if I were the good shepherd to say, you know what, there are some that just are not worth saving. This demonic slave girl who's being used as a prop for profit, you know, she's so insignificant, she's just not worth shedding any blood over. Who cares? Or what about that Philippian jailer? He's a government employee working for the Romans of all people. Corrupt government. Who wants to die for him? He's not worth saving either. But not so the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. And sheep like you and I too. 
What did all these people that we have met so far, what did they have in common? They have in common that the Good Shepherd laid his life down for all of them, regardless of their situation, regardless of their background. The Lord Jesus loved them enough to die for them. They have value because they belong to him. And it is what draws us in common too. We come from all sorts of different backgrounds. We have all sorts of different things going on in our lives. What do we have in common? Jesus, the good shepherd, gave his life for us too. And just like the Philippian jailer, what must you do, be, what must you do to be saved? Believe. Believe him. Trust him. Receive him as your Savior and Lord. Understand and accept the fact that he died for you. He loves you so much that he gave his life for you. Receive your forgiveness of sins. And trust him with your life. And then ask him to use you in whatever way he would want to use you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that you would speak to each individual heart in this room. Those who happen to be watching on their computer or their smartphone. And convince us of the truth that none of us are too undesirable, too untalented, uneducated, untrained, too old or maybe too young. There's no one who is out of reach of your love, out of reach of your grace. Well, Lord, I pray that those listening and watching, if there's one who hasn't received you as Savior and Lord, as Good Shepherd, that today, now, in these moments, they would cry out to you, Save me, Lord Jesus. Forgive my sin. Make me part of your sheepfold. And help me to live for you. I believe in you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with hymn number 46. Number 46, shall we stand please?
Listen, if there's anyone here who has a question, a doubt about their own salvation, let's pray together. Let's talk about that. I want you to be sure and confident that you are a child of God, that you belong in a sheepfold. If there's anybody watching online, you know, call us. You know how to contact us. We want to answer that question and make sure that you know where you stand with the Lord. And now to God our Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.